And of course, while you're over there, we've got our sports book review section. We review a lot of the biggest names in the industry, tell you about some of their features, some of the facts, deposit methods, withdrawal methods, all that type of stuff. But as you know, our friends over at DSI Sportsbook offering that BTB25 promo code, $25 free bet just for signing up, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, and 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino as well. At BetDSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two professional handicappers today. The first, Mr. Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. Bradley, how's it going today, man? It's going well. How are you doing on this fine Thursday morning? I'm doing well, man. No complaints here for me. Uh, plenty of things to get to here on the college football side. But before we get into that, I do want to touch on something that's probably a little bit of a sensitive subject, but it is something that happens to the best of us, and, and it's happening to a lot of people that we know out there uh, in the industry. It's, it's been a difficult college football year for a lot of people. Variance just hasn't run the right way. Uh, when you're having a down year, Brad, and I'm sure our listeners you know, know all about having down years, and I know I do as well, do you do anything differently? Do you, do you change your approach? What are you looking for? No, I mean, you, you want to tweak some things. I, I mean, it could, you know, carry on, you know, as is and act like nothing's happening and saying all is well. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily a good uh, approach. Uh, you, you, might, you kind of see what the, you do some self-scouting. Uh, you maybe compare that maybe you have, you know, unknowingly done a little couple things differently than what you've done in past years and you don't even know you've done it, you self-scout, look at how you're doing maybe uh, in, in particular roles. Uh, are you doing better backing favorites, backing underdogs? Uh, I mean, maybe you're missing some stuff. Maybe you have more power five plays and group of five plays, more sides than totals. I mean, self-scouting is good, but, to you know, after you've had a couple of winning years, uh, which I've had, uh, you don't want to vary too far. If what's worked in the past, just because you've had a bad couple of first months, and especially – you know, the, the big thing that I look at now that I'm out here in Vegas, I mean, I, I want to know that I'm on the right side as far as, you know, the line goes. Is it moving against me or is it moving with me? And, and I know a lot of my customers always think, that, you know, the right side is the winning side. I get all that. But if you're beating the closing number consistently, game after game after game, and you're just, you know, you just happen to lose, uh, I would chalk that up as a small sample size of variance and probably consider the, you know, the last two years of 400 picks instead of, of, you know, the last 50 or 60 picks. Well, and I know that you tend to do very, very well in bowl season, so I certainly expect you to uh, pick things up here at the end of the year and, and go on a nice little run. But it can be very frustrating. And like you said, you know, you're out there beating the market. You're out there getting good numbers. I know you play the win openers as well. And you know, sometimes things just don't work out. And that happens from time to time. And it's something that you know, uh, is a good learning tool for our listeners because one of the most important things when it comes to those down years is still maintaining your proper bankroll management. You know, if, if you're betting responsibly, if you're betting a responsible percentage of your bankroll, you know, yeah, you're, you may not have a very good year, but your your risk of ruin is going to go down quite a bit. So that is something that's very important to keep in mind is that if you are in a rut, if you are in a down part of your handicapping, you know, don't go chasing with five, six, seven percent plays. Stick to what you've been doing and, and try to build it back up that way. Yeah, there's no doubt. No, no chasing from me. I mean, I, I'd like to. <laughs> I mean, the, the temptation's always there to go all in on, on one particular play, but I have found out in, in the past that that just doesn't work, uh, at least for me. So, uh, you know, look, it, it just if they call, they call it gambling for a reason. Uh, if they called it winning, uh, that, that would be nice because then you can go ahead and do that each and every year. But when you're going up against the, you know, you're going up against Alabama each and every week when the sports books have shown a profit in 50 consecutive months, uh, it's not easy. Otherwise everyone would do it. And, uh, if I had all the answers and I've told people this and some people like it, some people don't, but if I had all the answers and I could guarantee, uh, you know, a 55, 57, 60% season each and every year. I mean, why in the heck would anyone in this country work? I mean, if the solution was, hey, buy Brad's newsletter for 69 bucks and I can get rich quick, uh, I mean, the, the logic behind that, I, I'm happy to, you know, for, to have people as customers and stuff, but, you know, the logic behind it, I'll get rich quick if I just buy his newsletter. I just, I, I honestly, be, to be honest with you, Adam, I, I'm i not looking for that type of customer and to get rich quick. I'm just not that guy. I'm not the guy that, that's putting out locks of the week, games of the year every single week. 
All right, well, we had a listener question here from At The Public Dog, and it's just something sort of fun. Maybe I don't know how much of an impact it actually has, although we do have uh, one matchup between these two teams here this week with Army and Air Force going up against each other. But, Brad, the the listener wanted to know, just out of curiosity, how you had the option teams uh, ranked in terms of your power ratings. Yeah, I mean, service academies, or we're just talking option teams? Option teams in general, throw New Mexico in there, Georgia Southern, uh, you know, all of them that are out there. Well, it's easy. Start at the top. We'll go with Georgia Tech. They're, they're clearly the, the best team when it comes to pure power rating uh, with option football. They're a power rate to me as a top 25 team. And with the backdoor cover against Clemson last week, they're the only remaining unbeaten team against the spread this year. So uh, that uh, <laughs> that's not too bad to, in that regard on both fronts. I would say number two would be Navy. Uh, they're the top rushing offense in the country. Uh, they've been the consistent, you know, the last 10, 15 years. They've been the best uh, service academy uh, year in and year out. And obviously they already chalked up a win against Air Force already this season. Navy would be the number two team. And then I go ahead and put Air Force uh, in and slide them in at number three. Uh, Vegas agrees with that, the fact that they're laying more than a field goal at home this week uh, against Army. In fact, that laying about a touchdown there says, you know, on a neutral, they'd probably be about a, uh, you know, a two to three point favorite over Army. Then, then Army comes in and for me uh, at the number four spot. Obviously, they made some major gains here in the last couple of years, back to back bowls for the first time since 1984, 1985. Uh, it, it's good, and it makes that Army Navy game good. I mean, and the TV ratings show it each and every year. That TV rating seems to go up, and it's actually becoming one of the most watched college football games of the year. Nothing pleases me more than that to be honest with you. And then uh, re- bringing up the rear would be New Mexico. You know, their, their rushing offense uh, has really tanked a little bit this year. They're off a 42-3 to loss to Wyoming where they had seven turnovers. Bob Davies done a tremendous job with the program. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of an off year for them. And then really bringing up the rear uh, is Georgia Southern, who shame on them. You know, Tyson Summers was a very bad hire for them. He tried, again, that they they cannot ditch the option offense at Georgia Southern. That's been the staple since they, they began a program in the early 80s there. And uh, there's they've had two coaches recently now that have tried to ditch the option a little bit, one being Brian Van Gorder about a decade ago, and now Tyson Summers, and it just hasn't worked for either. Uh, they're having, a, you know, obviously, a pathetic year. Uh, they haven't won a game yet. Uh, one of them that we, we did overlook there, how about Tulane? I mean, this is a team that I've had a hard time trying to rank here throughout the season, kind of move them up with some of their early performances, down with some of their recent performances. Where do they slot in? Hey, yeah, great call there. Uh, I apologize for that. You know, actually, even though they beat Army earlier this year, uh, I got them behind Army and slightly ahead of New Mexico. I, I Looked at, they were looking really good early, but the you know, last couple of games have been a very bad look for them, starting with the, the, the double-digit favorite role against FIU, losing that game outright. Haven't been able to get a good handle on them. Uh, yeah, again, even though they beat Army, that was at home, and I thought Army completely outplayed them. I was very fortunate to get a cover with Tulane in that game. But uh, we'll see. Now, now, as far as future prospects, if they can hold on to Willie Fritz for a couple more years, then they might be climbing and getting possibly close to the Navy territory uh, as a, a perennial type of bowl team. That's the, that's the kind of expectations I have for how good of a coach Willie Fritz is. But, you know, right now I, I would have them behind all three service academies in Georgia Tech. I think that's one of the hard things is that I feel like in the middle of, of the power ratings there, maybe from, say, 40 to 80, 40 to 90, something like that, there's just been so much inconsistency with those teams, and, and that's probably why they're uh, you know, power rated in that particular position. But I feel like that's something that I've had a lot of trouble with here this year, You know, doing updated power ratings each week over at bangthebook.com. You know, there are some teams I, I kind of move them up, and then all of a sudden I'm moving them back down, or I just keep moving them up, and then they hit a stopping point, And then I'm like, okay, you know, is this team accurately rated? Should I lower them again? I think that's been part of the problem here too is that we just have so many teams that are improved, consistent, and I think that's been something that's that's kind of hurt, you know, us and and a lot of the other people that are out there that we know that are struggling this year. Oh, I totally agree. There's no consistency, whether it's consistency of being good, consistency of being bad. Just when you think, hey, that's a great time to play against a team, and then, then they have an outlier performance and turn right around the next week and go back to being bad. A lot of inconsistency, inconsistency, and you're exactly right. It's in that. 
you know, 40 to 80 range where a lot of times I find a lot of my uh, plays per week. I'm not a guy that, that likes to, you know, play the top play, you know, game of the week each and every week. Uh, I like to play uh, upon the, the teams that, you know, some of the lower level power five, you know, top level group of five type of teams. And you're exactly right. <laughs> There's just no consistency whatsoever uh, with a lot of these teams. Uh, you know, one week, you know, you look at a team like New, New Mexico, they're getting beat 38 to nothing against uh, Fresno State. Next week, they almost outright upset Colorado uh, State. And then the next week, they're getting beat 42 to three against Wyoming. So, and then let's look at Fresno State. You're up, 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 up all season long. Oh, all right, this is the best team in the division in the Mountain West. They hammer San Diego State. And then they're playing a backup quarterback in UNLV. And they're a three touchdown favorite and they lose the game outright. UNLV is another very inconsistent team. So, it, that, that's probably hurting more uh, than anything this year, at least from what I found. And, boy, a lot of times this time of year, I'm making slight upgrades and downgrades of the power rings, half points, points. But this year in particular, I mean, on a week-to-week basis, it feels like, you know, this team gets upgraded two and a half, then the next week they're down two and a half. You know, a team like Southern Miss, very inconsistent. UAB's had a good season, but they've been inconsistent the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I – that you're, I wasn't thinking about that, but the, now that you brought that up, that's probably the number one reason why I haven't had a successful college football season to date. Yeah, Southern Miss is one for me, too. Louisiana Tech is one where I just have no idea where to put them. Week after week, my Navy lines are a little bit high, and they're in that 35 to 40 range. So, yeah, I, I think that that really is part of the problem. And, and that may be something that we just have to adjust to in terms of college football overall, because I, I think what we're running into here with some of the – inspired hires of young coaches that and some of them have veteran defensive coordinators as well. You know, I think about a team like Troy, where they've got Vic Kenning down there as the defensive coordinator with Neil Brown. You know, it just seems like the talent pool is spread out so much more. And I don't know if it just means that there's more talent overall or just that you know, you've got, I mean, think about a guy like Ed Oliver, for example, Ed Oliver could be starting at a, a big 12 school on the defensive line, but he went to Houston. You know, you have guys like this throughout the country that are just really, really supreme players. A Richie James at Middle Tennessee State, for example. You've got these guys that are just really, really good, and and they're at schools where you wouldn't really expect them to go. And I think that, that you know, the, the the amount of talent that we see spread out across the country is just so significant now that I think it makes it hard because you've got star power on some of these teams, but also you have these teams that have a lot of one and two star recruits starting at, at, at important positions. So maybe it's just something that we're going to have to get used to. It's something that we're going to have to adjust to going forward. Yeah, and uh, I think some of it has to do with, uh, you know, it's easy. It, you know, you can find guys now. A lot of guys don't go slip uh, under the radar now. And, you know, maybe a lot of guys just didn't, didn't go to, to the colleges. Maybe they ended up going to JUCOs and stuff now. But uh, out there in the recruiting process with all the films and social media and everything, you can find some, a lot of diamonds in the rough. Uh, out there uh, in the sport and uh, look a lot of people look there's the future of football you know it's a little bit in question but well let's face it uh, a lot of I would say compared to you know 40 50 years ago uh, there's more people playing football than uh, you know a lot of the you know in the past a lot of people are playing you know three or four different sports you know the football is the, the dominant sport now in America and a lot of people aren't jumping from sport to sport so that specialization I think also helps some of the guys that would have normally been you know, a two-star guy, but since they were focusing in on, you know, baseball and basketball in the off season, the fact that they're, you know, working on football almost year round, I think that helps a lot of the guys that would have been one and two-star players, you know, and maybe you're still a little bit overlooked in the recruiting process, actually be, you know, our three or four star type of talent. All right, well, let's get into some of these games here and start breaking down some of these individual matchups. And we'll start with Friday night's game here. This is a real interesting one for me. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a play on this game and uh, fortunately for me, the number is coming down on it. Marshall takes on Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic, seven-and-a-half-point favorite here in Boca for this one. Brad, how do you see this game? Well, I bet Marshall. So you and I can have a nice little uh, talk here. I bet Marshall plus 10. So I- I'm happy uh, where the line had moved. I-, I just took an early 10 number. I don't think too many people out there in the marketplace have it. We talked about this last week. We wanted to play on Florida Atlantic. Well, what happened – Last week uh, is exactly, to me, what, why I don't want to play at least Florida Atlantic or at least, you know, anything above a touchdown. Uh, I, I can get talked into Florida Atlantic at seven. 
uh, as I'll try to middle. But, you know, what happened last week was two disparate results. Marshall, you know, loses outright to FIU as a 16-point favorite. Does that expose them, or was that an outlier? I think you're going to say, hey, that exposed a very mediocre team that was beating up on poor competition. I, I get that understanding, but still, I, I don't know if I necessarily want, want to play against a team that, that failed to cover the spread by four touchdowns. On the flip side, you know, FIU got some pub, but the fact that they were favored on the road against the two-time conference defending conference USA champ. Uh, I mean, Western Kentucky led that game 28-20. Uh, I mean, FAU scored the game's final 22 points, so I thought that was a little bit misleading uh, win and cover for them. Marshall does have 26 players from the state of Florida on their roster, so this is an important game for them. Uh, I'm very happy with my plus 10 bet. If the line continues to come down, though, uh, you know, I, I can see you uh, and see your play on Florida Atlantic. You know, if I can get six and a half, which I doubt I'll get, but if I do, then, then I'll be all with you there as far as taking the hours. But uh, I'm happy with, uh, you know, my early bet two and a half points ahead of the market price right now. What's really interesting about this game to me is that the number is coming down while the total shoots up. This is a total that opened 61, 61 and a half out there early on in the week. Bookmaker now dealing 67 and a half, and it actually popped all the way up to 68 and a half before getting some buyback. And for Marshall, they haven't played a game with a total higher than 52 so far in conference play. And, and that concerns me because if this is going to be a shootout, that's what Florida Atlantic wants because this Marshall defense has been the strength of this football team. But who have they played offensively? You know, they played North Carolina State. North Carolina State is efficient. They take care of the football. Beyond that, Miami of Ohio, Kent State, Cincinnati, Charlotte, Old Dominion, Middle Tennessee State without Brent Stock still. This is a step up in class for this defense. And if I'm wrong and I lose this bet because Marshall's defense – is actually that good, that's fine. Then at least I know that going forward because they've finally been tested. Up to this point, though, Marshall hasn't played anybody like this offense with Kendall Bryles, like this offense with Devin Singletary, who's already a 1,000-yard rusher this year. You know, Jason Driscoll, a mobile quarterback threat. They've got other mobile guys that can be back there if, if Driscoll gets hurt or something like that. That's the worry for me. Is I, I'm surprised at this total going up with this spread coming down because – I mean, Marshall's offense is fine. They take care of the football. They've got 5.6 yards per play on the year, but they can't win an arms race with Florida Atlantic as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that, that, there's, the correlation here does not make any sense. Uh, for If you're thinking Marshall's going to cover the spread, you would think a lower scoring game. Uh, the fact that it's been bet way up, really, to me, I like the under now as well, to be honest with you. I already got my Marshall ticket uh, as far as, and I put a line out, on every single total uh, as well early in the week. And a lot of times, you know, I, I'm look, I don't necessarily understand the, the market when it comes to total line movement. Uh, I just think it's sometimes inefficient, uh, to be honest with you, because when it comes to totals markets, a lot of people don't understand it as well as the sides. And you get a lot of the steam chasers after a couple of two, three point line move on a total. Then everyone starts, you know, steam chasing it, and then all of a sudden you got a six-point line move, which is the case in this particular game. But, you know, I had it around 60, 61, which is about where it opened up, and now at 68, I got, I got to play on the under. I already am thinking Marshall is going to keep it relatively competitive, but and I think there will be some correlation. If you like Marshall, take the under. If you like Florida Atlantic, uh, take the over. So, But the, the, the lines are moving in opposite directions. So, and that's another thing I've seen in a lot of games that, that this year that to me just uh, I'm not grasping. And maybe it's mostly on me and shame on me for that. But uh, from watching these games, uh, and to me, and you already said it, that it just doesn't make too much sense to, that they're going in opposite directions right now. All right, let's go to Saturday here. Game 331, 332 on the board in the ACC. Syracuse takes on Florida State, and this is another interesting line move. Syracuse with that big win over Clemson a couple weeks ago. Dino Babers has this program, for the most part, going in the right direction. Florida State, on the other hand, going in the wrong direction. But again, you look at the line move for this game where it opened Florida State minus four. It's only gone up to four and a half pinnacles at five. So a little bit of sharp involvement looks to be coming in on the Seminoles. That has to be purely a numbers play, and, and I get it. My number is seven and a half on this game, but this is one of those cases where with Florida State, you have to respect the talent level. From a power rating standpoint, you have to keep them higher than you know what their actual reality probably is, and people keep getting burned by doing that, and, and I just think back to the Boston College game with a pretty big move on Florida State, and then they just got trucked. 
Oh, yeah, they did. I mean, I had a three ticket on Florida State last week. Uh, what did it close? Six, six and a half. Again, you're ahead of the marketplace, and the market couldn't have been more wrong on the game. So, uh, again, I'm happy with my betting and being ahead of the market, but, man, uh, I I I've ne- I couldn't imagine losing as many plays as I have this season ahead of the line move, three, three and a half, four points in some instances. You're exactly right. Pure numbers game here. I understand the line movement from that aspect and that aspect only. I have it, a pure power rating number. I have Florida State six, but when I and, and that's what I do. A lot of people have different you know sets of power ratings as far as hey, I have a pure power rating number. Here's what it is, or I have a power rating where. You know, it's a power ring. Then I factor in the situation, the series history, the weather, and all this other stuff. You know, when I do my computer projected power rated lines, that's all that is. That, that's not my, you know, final line on the game. That's my handicapping number and my projected score in my weekly newsletter. That, that's the, the overall number that I have on that particular game, not just the, the one set of power ratings. But my one set of power ratings, that doesn't factor in anything other than talent level of the two teams and how they performed so far has Florida State six. Am I going to take Florida State? Absolutely not. Don't like the situation. Syracuse comes in off a bye. I thought off a somewhat misleading game against Miami where they still, you know, almost pulled the outright upset, still covered, despite the fact they had four turnovers in the first half. I don't like what I see body language-wise from Florida State. I thought finally – uh, the Boston College game, their defense kind of gave out on them. The, the offense has been inconsistent all season. Their freshman quarterback hasn't shown much improvement here. He continues to consistently turn the ball over and make freshman mistakes. But, uh, I mean, when you start in seven, eight games, you got to start to see some growth, and I'm just not seeing it. So I'll let the number continue to rise, and maybe when it's all said and done at the end of the week, I'll have some Syracuse uh, in pocket for me. All right, let's jump out to Conference USA here, and let's talk about a couple of teams we really haven't talked about too much here on the show game, 407-408 between UTSA and Florida International. Both of these teams, 5-2, and two, so both of them looking for one more win to get bowl eligible, and that was a big surprise for UTSA last year. This year, it wouldn't be as much of a surprise, but on the FIU side, it would be a very big surprise for this team to get into a bowl game here in the first year of Butch Davis, who hasn't coached since, what, 2010 or something like that? maybe even earlier than that. So it's a pretty interesting game here. A lot on the line for both teams. Pretty much one-sided UTSA money here, number open three and a half. It's up to four with extra juice or four and a half in the marketplace. FIU is, is a tough team to rate right now because they've got some nice wins over Tulane and over Marshall here over the last couple of weeks. But if you look at them statistically, things don't line up to a five and two team, do they? No, they don't, and I have FIU. Even though they're five and two, you know, it ranked one through one thirty. I got them one ten in the country, so I still don't have too much respect for them uh, in a pure power rating, which does factor in the the statisticals uh, for the game. And you know, pure power rating number for me uh, on the game says, you know, it's about right. I actually have UTSA four and a half here, and the reason being is. It's not so much that I'm kind of down on FIU. I'm, I think the market has overrated UTSA ever since they they beat Baylor outright in that game. We've proven that that Baylor, obviously it hasn't been, forget Baylor of two, three years ago. They're not even Baylor last year uh, being 0-8. So I thought they got overpriced in the marketplace after that one. They're 2-4 and four against the number uh, since. And, and, you know, one of their covers being by about point last week on the road at UTEP. You know, I just I haven't seen the domination from UTSA like we saw in some parts last year when they went to a bowl. Uh, for me, uh, I like the confidence level uh, that FIU is playing, and they're not going to be intimidated here. They've already pulled off a couple of big wins already, and last week's game well, I thought was legitimate. I know Marshall got some yards late, but the FIU was you know came into that one from start to finish and was clearly the right side in their big outright upset. I, it's tough for me to, and I'm going to be honest with you, I won't have a bet in the game. Uh, backing a team off back-to-back outright upsets as a double-digit underdog, that's a tough sell for me to go ahead and do it again. But one thing one thing is for certain, he might be out of the coaching ranks for the last six, seven years, but the man did not forget how to coach, and I thought he was one. Of, and when he was coaching, he was one of the better coaches in college football, and maybe top 10 top 15 level at Miami and even at North Carolina, maybe he was cheating. So what? And the guy can coach. And if he gets FIU in a bowl game, look for that program to start taking off, getting the extra 15 practices. Yeah. I mean, you kind of looked at this situation for FIU and and when they let Mario Cristobal go, you're thinking, 
what, what is going on with the direction of this program? And then obviously they have a few down years. Make what was a very surprising hire to get Butch Davis. I, I don't know if it was a legitimacy thing. I don't know if it was they wanted an experienced guy. But whatever the case may be, it's worked out for them. And, and they have a very good shot of getting to a bowl game here. You know, they could possibly pull a slight upset in this one. Uh, the rest of their schedule is kind of favorable. They've got UMass in the last game if they need a win. So you know, we'll see what happens with FIU here going forward. One more game I want to look at in depth here, and that's game 411-412 in the SEC East between Florida and Missouri. This number open two and a half, three with extra juice, three and a half out there in the marketplace now. Obviously the big story here, the firing of Jim McElwain at Florida. Is this helpful for the team? Is it harmful to the team? What do you think? I usually say uh, it's helpful for maybe one game and one game only. You normally see an uptick. Uh, at least in one game with an interim coach. And I think this is the case here because, you know, I think the players legitimately really like and will rally around Randy Shannon, uh, who's the interim coach who has some head coaching experience at at Miami. So I kind of like the uptick here. I don't like uh, Florida's injury situation. They just lost another key player in in their leading rusher. Uh, They've opened up the quarterback spot here. But, yeah, I think there's – a one-game uptick, and I see that not only at the college level, but even the NFL level, where you get that, you know, you get that new voice there, and it works for a week. And, you know, well, what's there to hurt? You know, to, to go all in for one particular week. Now, if it doesn't go right for that particular week, then it, it's sell city uh, for for me uh, from that point forward. Uh, if it goes well, that then sometimes you can get two or three game upticks where, where the team plays a little bit above their expectation level. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have Florida on my handicapping card, but Florida will probably be in pocket for me personally at plus three and a half. Uh, I'm not afraid to take a shot here on the Gators. I think one of the big things here about this game, and one of the things that makes it so challenging is that with everything going on with this Florida offense, and and let's be honest, Jim McElwain was brought in to fix the Florida offense, and he did not. He had success with this team, but it was largely on the defensive side of the ball. But the question that I have here is, what the hell is Missouri? I mean, I don't know what they are. You know, they've scored 120 points the last two weeks against Idaho and UConn, which means absolutely nothing to me. Gave up 53 to Georgia, 40 to Kentucky, 51 to Auburn. You know, I mean, if Missouri can score here, then obviously they can and probably have some success. But this is a really good Florida defense that they're facing, even with all the turnover, even with all the uncertainty. So, you know, even if you take Florida out of the handicap, which, you know, is certainly something you can do with the McElwain firing, I don't know what I'm going to get from Missouri, not just in this game, but next week against Tennessee on November 18th at Vanderbilt against Arkansas to wrap up the regular season. Like, I just, I don't know what I'm going to get from the Tigers in conference play. Yeah, in conference play, you hit the nail on the head in conference play. Now, we have seen one trend, and this is one to put in your pocket for Barry Odom. He is not afraid to run it up on non-conference you know, group of five FCS teams. He's done that consistently each of the last two years. So keep that in mind. Uh, I shame on me for not going right. I had him against Idaho. I thought that'd be a nice spot for him. Didn't didn't go right back to the well last week and probably should have. But you're right. I mean, their disparities between who they, you know, their scores involving power five competition and, and group of five competition I mean, look, their average score in their three wins versus the non-Power 5 teams, 64 to 25. Their five losses against Power 5 teams, they've been outscored 42 to 18. It doesn't get any more disparate than that. Uh, I I got the better defense getting more than a field goal, and I expect them to play at least an emotional game. That's why I'm not afraid to, to take a chance here and take a flyer on the Gators. Now, I will say this, if Missouri gets the win and looks comfortable, then, you know, I, I, the buy sign might be on for me, even in conference play, because, you know, what I, I would say that they got a little bit more stability than obviously Tennessee. We'll see what Vanderbilt does in the next couple of weeks there. But then, give them credit, they have covered four straight games here. And if they get a, a win and cover this week, then, I mean, that, that would be five straight covers and, and three straight wins. Then the buy sign might actually be on for me, even in, even in conference play for Missouri. You were very nice about talking about the shit show that Tennessee is right now. I, I appreciate the way that you uh, so eloquently talked around that point. And, and this is something I talked about with Cheetah early on in the week is that now this number has gone back up to six and a half or seven. But the fact that Tennessee was a five point home favorite against Southern Miss, what a debacle. I mean, what, what a massive fall from grace for this program over the last 
10 to 15 years. Oh, no doubt. And forget that. Just in the last year, this was a team going, heading into last year that was a top preseason, top 10 team heading into last season. Obviously disappointed. Uh, unbelievable to me. Pure power rating said they were clearly to play. I understand the line move, but at the current number, I, I even though it's probably one of my strongest power rated plays of the week because I'm not a big fan of what I've seen from Southern Miss and their inconsistency this year. I, I'm not going to have a Tennessee ticket. I, I just I can't trust them in the, in this particular spot. I downgraded some of the power ratings. I shaded off what would be like four or four and a half points of home field advantage. I mean, who's going to be in the stance for this game? Maybe you give them only two and a half or three, and that's one thing that I don't. And I'm going to bring it up slightly here. I know we're running out of time, but one thing you need to do with your home field advantages: don't necessarily have a set number from the start of the season to the end of the season. If you got teams that are out of bowl mix that have had very disappointing seasons, don't be afraid to knock that home field advantage down a half point, or some extreme cases like Tennessee down a point in your power ratings from what you had for their home field advantage at the start of the season. On the flip side, if you've got an exciting team that's overachieving and they're starting to get, you know, have more fan support, don't be afraid to up that a half point, uh, a half point or a point. Every half point or point matters in this marketplace. And I just want to throw that out there that a lot of people aren't doing that in the month of November. Excellent point that you make there. Before we wrap up college football here and take a look at the NFL for a few minutes, do you have a uh, Brad Powers exclusive free pick on the college football side? You know what I do here, and, uh, you know, it's not like me to do this, but you can f- still find some 13 and a halfs out there. I'm going to take Notre Dame. I know that they're perceived to be in a flat spot here, but this team, it, it, to me, is not like any team that I've seen from Notre Dame in the last 25 years. They dominate their opponent at the line of scrimmage, almost everyone with the exception of Georgia. And, I mean, we understand that. Georgia obviously ranked number one in the country at this point. And I I like what I've heard from Brian Kelly. He said at not one point this year we talk about winning, we just talk about dominating. And we've seen no line movement whatsoever. The fact that Wake Forest will be without their top playmaker on offense, their wide receiver, Dorch, who by far is their best wide receiver, just set a school record last week. He's out for the season. Their leading rusher just got ruled out for this game. And, oh, yeah, by the way, their leading tackler on defense just got ruled out for the game. Don't understand the line move. I'll gladly take Notre Dame minus 13.5, and and they got a hidden factor here. Their defensive coordinator, Mike Elko, was the defensive coordinator at Wake Forest the last three years. He knows the players' strengths and weaknesses. I think Notre Dame, I, I do think it's sustainable when you can dominate your opponent at the line of scrimmage. Even if they are flat, they're just going to line up and, and run right at Wake Forest with their multitude of backs. Uh, I think they're clearly the right play here against a banged-up Wake Forest team. I like it. Very strong, confident play there. As we transition over to the NFL side here for a few minutes, I want to touch on a couple of these games here with the professionals. Let's go to game 457-458. Cincinnati takes on Jacksonville. Jacksonville now up to a five and a half point favorite. There are still a couple of fives out there, but when you're seeing a number move from three and a half to five and a half with a total in the upper thirties, that's significant. Oh, no question. And it concerns me because I'm starting to, to get a little bit talked into the Cincinnati side. I, you know, can I make a comment? I love that you give me these games that could go either way. that are just probably some of the most intriguing handicap games and not necessarily games that I'm going to have, big and significant plays and opinions on. But in this particular case, how can you trust Cincinnati? The market loved them last week. They probably should have lost outright as a double-digit home favorite. I thought I saw some buy signs from them in a three, four game period, starting with the, 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 the removal of their offense coordinator and the new offense coordinator in the Green Bay game. But last couple of weeks for them have not been good. Jacksonville, what the hell are you going to get for, out of them? I mean, they've been the, the definition of a Jekyll and Hyde team in the NFL this year. They've alternated wins and losses in every single game. And, oh, yeah, that Indianapolis team that should have beaten Cincinnati outright last week won well, Jacksonville's last game. that They hammered them 27 to nothing. Uh, had 10 sacks second time this season. They've had 10 sacks in a game. Uh, just a pure power ratings play for me, even though my confidence level of trusting either team isn't significantly high. I'm going to have a Cincinnati probably ticket of plus five and a half. I don't know if you can trust Jacksonville laying almost a touchdown uh, against what's been perceived perennial playoff caliber team in Cincinnati the, the last 10 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about this one because one of the things that we've noticed in the NFL market here all year long is that it almost doesn't matter what the spot is. Every team coming off of a bye has taken on money. And of course, this week we've got a game with two teams coming off the bye between the Rams and the Giants, so it doesn't apply in that game. But 
this is one of them here. Jacksonville played a pretty difficult schedule. You know, they played on the road in London, then they played on the road in New York, on the road in Pittsburgh, came home, had a flat spot against the Rams. Although they did outplay the Rams in that game by a pretty large margin, just wound up losing it. But now they're coming off to buy it. And kind of the question I have here in this spot is, is this the bye week steam or is this an actual position on Jacksonville? That's one of the things I've been trying to ascertain here. And, you know, I mean, I, I get exactly where you're coming from with Cincinnati and, and the line value and the low total. And it's so hard, man. you got two bad quarterbacks in this game. you got two <laughs> solid defenses. Jacksonville's probably got you know a top three defense in the NFL. It's a hard handicap. And, and it's tricky because, you know, as you know, I'm in the super contest. And this is something that we talk about on the show here a lot. With six teams on buys this week, you have to make some unsavory plays. And, and this is a game that I'm going to be very interested to see what the split is out there in the market. Yeah, and again, look, a lot of my customers expect the same amount of plays in the NFL each week when you've got your three games less short. I mean, that's significant. In the NFL, that's like you know taking 20% of your options out the window, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, boy, I, I still, though, the trust level that I have for either team is not very high. I do like the, the direction, if you're asking me, Hey, what, uh, you know, the, the franchise's direction, obviously Jacksonville's on the up and up. Cincinnati, I think, that's the, the, the down part uh, of the Marvin Lewis era. But, man, five and a half. I mean, you look at some of Jacksonville's results here. I, I mean, that's fine. You can trust them in the underdog role, you know, again, on the road against Houston and London against Baltimore, against the, the Steelers. But, you know, they were laying against the Jets, lost that game, laying at home against the Rams, lost that game outright. I don't know if they're there yet where you can trust them, this improving franchise, in a nearly touchdown favorite spot against a team that, that's at least a franchise that's been better than them uh, for the last six, seven, eight years. One more game I want to touch on here, and, and this is game 463, 464 between Baltimore and Tennessee. Tennessee's a three-and-a-half point favorite here. This number opened four-and-a-half at Bookmaker, so it has come down a little bit. This is another one where I just – I feel like I don't know who Tennessee is at this point. You know, they probably should have lost that game to the Browns a couple of weeks ago. They're coming off the bye here this week. I've got a Baltimore team to rest, and, and playing the teams coming off of Thursday Night Football has been a very profitable angle for those that are out there. So, you know, it, it's just another one of those spots where I think you have two teams where you just don't really know what you're going to get, and, and that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, Baltimore starts off the season hot, impressive, 2-0. and Then they get blown out two straight games. They, they find themselves a little bit. And then they they lose in Minnesota, lose to Chicago, and then they're up, you know, beat Miami last Thursday night, 40 to nothing. Same with Tennessee. You're not seeing any consistency out of them. Uh, I was disappointing with their opener against Oakland. And then you think the buy sign's on, and they're getting beat 57-14 to 14 against Houston. I uh, lose to Miami. Uh, when when the Mariota was out for that particular game. They have won their last two, but the Cleveland performance was despicable. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, I, I'll play against a team off a 40-point win, uh, even though they got extra time. Flacco uh, obviously is good here. That's why the line's somewhat cheap at three and a half. Tennessee coming off a bye. I, I like the spot for them here. Uh, I, I'm going to have a Tennessee, and they might even be on my card, believe it or not. I, I I'm okay trusting Tennessee in this particular spot. I like playing against teams that are off such an outlier blowout win that Baltimore had last week, and I, I like Tennessee resetting themselves, a young franchise coming off a bye. Well, and as good as everyone says this Baltimore defense is, and, and don't get me wrong, from a personnel standpoint, it's pretty good, but they've given up 4.2 yards per carry this year. So, I mean, it's not like they're among the upper echelon. I mean, they're kind of in the middle of the pack there when it comes to stuffing the run, and we all know what – Tennessee wants to do with the football so you know I think that's a, another interesting one here and again it, it's a challenging week in the NFL it seems like all weeks in the NFL are challenging but especially when you have three fewer games to try and pick from Brad Powers of bradpowersports.com what's going on over there at the website right now man yeah right now at the website if you go to bradpowersports.com I talk about it each and every week and you know and I'm going to just talk about a couple of other different products but the, the main product is the Powers Picks newsletter it gets emailed to you each and every Wednesday it's got a game right up on every single college football game doesn't matter if it's involving Alabama or South Alabama you get that you get my power ratings you get a recap of the previous week whether it be misleading finals bad beats computer projected lines trends of the week 
Uh, also, we talk about the NFL, uh, the game right up for all those games, logs, you name it, we got it in there. You can check out past issues, download them for free to see what it's all about. It's just 49 bucks, not for this week, not for the rest of the month, but for the rest of the season, all the way through the Super Bowl, college and pro. And if you're interested in a couple of other new products that I've introduced to the marketplace this year, actually the Sunday Night Owl newsletter has had a profitable season. That gets released on Sunday. So if you want to see what I'm betting down at the win on Sunday, uh, when the openers come out here in Vegas, you can do that by purchasing the Sunday Night Owl newsletter. That's 35 bucks, And we also have a Vegas Wise Guys report for 35 bucks. If you have questions, concerns, Feel free to, to email me. You can contact me via uh, right there on the site at bradpowersports.com. Again, that's the website, 49 bucks for the regular newsletter. And you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers and the number seven. Brad, as always, man, a real pleasure, and I'll talk to you again next week, buddy. All right, sounds good. Take care, my friend.